Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. It is Thursday, July 21st, 2016. And here's a quick look what we got coming up. Tonight. And I'm telling him again, sir, there's no need for a firearm. I'm unarmed. He's an artistic guy. He had a uh, toy truck in his hand. When he hit me, I'm like, I still got my hands in there. I said, no, I just got shot. While police brutality continues to be an issue here in the U.S., the stories that often don't get told are the ones where officers are put in danger. That's next. Well, what? What are you doing? Because I don't know hey, what you have under there. Everybody, look at this guy. He came clearly to do some harm to uh, to the officer, to my person. It's hard to make that call. It's a, uh, it shakes you up. Any protests over the deaths of these cops today in Baton Rouge? I don't know that. I don't know that. Any riots or protests over the uh, uh, police officers in Dallas, Texas? What are you asking? It's a pretty simple question. You know, it was less than a week ago on Sunday morning that the Baton Rouge shooter, Gavin Long, targeted and assassinated police officers in a deadly ambush that left three officers dead and another three injured before he was shot and killed by a single marksman from 100 yards away. The surveillance photos recently released to the public show the killer carrying out his deadly attack on Baton Rouge police as they were cornered by a dumpster behind a beauty supply store before they were executed. The three police officers who were killed in this gutless and senseless rampage were Matthew Gerald, a former Marine who had only spent one year on the police force, Montrell Jackson, a new father and 10-year veteran of the force, and Brad Garofalo, married man, father of four children who, by the way, went down fighting, firing his weapon till the end in the gun battle as he bravely attempted to save one of his fellow officers. The killer before the rampage, Gavin Long, he posted a video on YouTube where he laid out his warped and delusional manifesto. If y'all want to keep protesting, do that. But for the serious ones, the real ones, the alpha ones, we know what it's going to take. It's only fighting back or money. That's all they care about. Revenue and blood. Revenue and blood. Revenue and blood. Nothing. After he put that video up on YouTube, he made it perfectly clear on Facebook and Twitter that he was outraged over the death of this man, Alton Sterling who had been recently killed by Baton Rouge police. And what followed was massive protest across the country led by none other than Black Lives Matter. And we all know what happened next in Dallas. The first wave of retaliation had begun. Sniper. 
sniper from up here somewhere. It's a sniper? You get a shot. Incidents like this occur, there's a big chunk of our fellow citizenry that feels as if, because of the color of their skin, they are not being treated the same. And that hurts. Now, I want to take a look at the raw footage of Alton Sterling getting shot and killed by police in Baton Rouge. And I got to warn you that this is graphic video. So if you're not the kind of person that can stomach this type of stuff, you might want to turn your head for a moment. But I think it's important that we analyze the video because the death of Alton Sterling played a big role in, well, pissing off the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, there was protest all across the nation, and it also led to the retaliation and murder of police officers in Dallas and Baton Rouge. Again, this is graphic video. Viewer discretion is advised. Police in Baton Rouge, Louisiana responded to a 911 call about a man walking around waving a gun and threatening people. The altercation with Alton Sterling began shortly after the cops arrived. I mean, you can see there he's resisting arrest. The, the police officers, they had to thrown to the ground. He was trying to get the gun out of his pocket and, well, the police had to deal with a life or death situation. The suspect was shot and killed on the spot. And you can see right there, they did indeed retrieve a gun from his pocket. Now, if you're one of those people who think that the officers reacted unjustly in this situation, I want you to stop and consider for a moment what it must be like to be in their shoes for a change. You think he could do that? I mean, these cops, we're talking about inner city cops. Their job is to confront potentially dangerous and deadly situations day in and day out. Alton Sterling was portrayed by the media as an innocent guy, a father of five who was murdered on the bloody streets of Baton Rouge by white cops because well, because he was black. But in reality, this guy was a career criminal. He was a street thug with a rap sheet a mile long. He was a danger to society. <laughs> Check out this guy's criminal record. I mean, my God. Possession of illegal firearms. Again and again and again. Aggravated burglary on more than one occasion. Drug possession over and over. Public intimidation, possession of stolen goods. He had several altercations and fights with police officers, domestic abuse, breaking and entering, and yes, he was a registered sex offender. And when the cops showed up, they knew he had a gun on him, and when he tried to pull it, they put him down. Call for white people like myself to put ourselves in the shoes of those African-American families who fear every time uh, their children go somewhere, who have to have the, the talk about, you know, how to uh, really protect themselves when they're the ones who should be expecting protection from encounters with the police. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton are asking white Americans to put themselves in the shoes of African-Americans to see what it's like to be racially profiled by police. I'd like to see Black Lives Matter do the same. Put yourselves in the cops' shoes. If you saw that video, it's, they pulled something like this from his pocket. Don't know if it was a gun, but I'm just about to show you naysayers who probably haven't had a lick of firearms training whether or not somebody could actually shoot from their pockets. Here we go. Now, I got on my shorts, okay? Bam, in my pocket. Here we go. Well. If I have my hands in my pocket, oh shit, I can still shoot from here. How about that? Or hands down at my side, bam. How about that? I can still shoot from here. All I have to do is touch the trigger and shoot. And if I'm down on my back and I'm in a struggle, pow, pow, pow. You don't know what the f 
you would do. So for those of you all who say the gun wasn't fully extended and drawn, you don't know a damn thing about guns. And that was U.S. Army veteran Mike Brown in a video post on Facebook showing us the dangerous situation that the Baton Rouge police found themselves in when they had to confront Alton Sterling. I mean, all Sterling had to do was grab his pocket and fire off a few rounds. Those cops were in immediate danger. What would you have done? Here's another video I want to share with you. Now, this is raw body cam footage shot by police in Savannah, Georgia. This is a routine traffic stop that turns deadly. Oh, uh, if you was on the right, yeah, which, 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 where you came from, I must have like, missed you. But, uh, yeah, I put my blinkers on, I stopped at the stop sign, and uh, I don't know why. Okay, you got your license on your partner? Uh, I don't have my license on my, it's at my, uh, my mom's house. All right, do me a favor, turn off your car. Okay, that's fine. Turn off the car. Hand me the key. Yeah, I'm just going to set it up here until we run your information and get it from there. Okay. Okay? Okay. What's your name? Tyree. T-Y-R-I-E. Last name? Tyler. C U Y. C U I C U C U Y Y L E R. And spell your first name again. Tyree. T Y R I E. All right. Is there anything in this car that we need to know about or worry about? Yes, sir. All right. Mind stepping out since you're acting a little nervous and stuff. I'm not acting nervous, sir. Yeah, you you acting a little nervous. You was hesitant on handing me the key and everything. So go ahead and step out the vehicle. No, I was not, sir. Do me a favor. Step out the vehicle. All right, I just want to make sure there's no weapons or anything. Do not be reaching in there, partner. Reaching, sir. Partner. Now you can see right there how quick this happened. Before you know it, the guy whips out a gun, shoots the officer, the, the cop goes down, and the suspect attempts to escape. The police return rapid fire. The suspect, 25-year-old Tyree Collier, was killed in the incident. And luckily, the officer survived. And it happened just like that. And, you know, that's what these cops deal with on a daily basis. And I think we all need to stop for a moment and think about what it's like to be in their shoes before we rush to judgment. And that's the problem I have with Black Lives Matter and the people who support their ideology, because it seems like they always rally behind the wrong guy. I mean, there's plenty of examples of cops abusing their power, using excessive force. There's lots of examples of police brutality. And yes, in some cases, cops are getting away with murder. But why rally behind a guy like Alton Sterling? I mean, that guy was street trash. And he should not be the poster child for racial profiling. I also think it's counterproductive to walk around yelling Black Lives Matter while threatening violence towards police. Any protests over the deaths of these cops today in Baton Rouge? I don't know that, I don't know that. Any riots or protests over the uh, uh, police officers in Dallas, Texas? What are you asking? It's a pretty simple question. Yeah, good question. And, you know, I thought the news crew from Fox 10 in Phoenix, Arizona, did a good job. You could see the video right there on YouTube, and we're going to show you a couple of short clips. But they invited one of the leaders of Black Lives Matter to a training session by police to see what it's like to be a cop in a dangerous situation where you have to make a split second decision whether or not to shoot someone. Check this out. Call about a possible burglar walking down the street. Mopping gets him on the ground. He's not complying. I need you to keep your hands up, sir. For what? Because I need to check that waistband. Well, what? What are you doing? Because I don't know hey, what you have under there. Everybody, look at this guy. He came clearly to do some harm to uh, to the officer, to my person. It's hard to make that call. It's a uh, it shakes you up. So that guy changed his opinion after spending the day with the Maricopa County Sheriff's Department in Phoenix, Arizona. Again, you have to put yourself in their shoes. Now, I want to share another video. Now, this is a woman who was protesting police in Dallas with Black Lives Matter. 
she got shot in the leg. And, you know, that was during that horrific day. And when it was all said and done, she had a change of heart about the Dallas Police Department. Police officers have started coming up the block. And one of them, I heard him when he said, is anybody hit? I said, yes, sir, I'm, I'm hitting my leg. And, and the other officer jumped on top of me and covered me and my son. I saw another officer. Oh. Saw another officer get shot right there in front of me. I'm so thankful for the Dallas Police Department. Now, before we go, I want to read a message from Officer Montrell Jackson, who posted this on Facebook just days before he was fatally shot and killed in Baton Rouge. The city must and will get better. I'm working in these streets, so any protesters, officers, friends, family, or whoever, if you see me and need a hug or want to say a prayer, I got you. Finally, I personally want to send prayers out to everyone directly affected by this tragedy. These are trying times. Please don't let hate infect your heart. Montrell Jackson was 32 years old, a 10-year veteran of the Baton Rouge Police Department, and a proud father of a newborn son. In honor of Montrell Jackson, I want to end this report on a positive note, because regardless of what you see on TV, there is progress being made to unite the country, ladies and gentlemen. During a BLM protest in Dallas, a counter protest started across the street. And then a representative from each group, well, they met in the middle and they joined forces. And before going home, they actually got together and they prayed for the city of Dallas together. And I'd like to thank Montrell, watch that moment from above, and I hope it put a big smile on his face.
Leanne McAdoo with InfoWars.com here in Cleveland covering the Republican National Convention. And we got word that there's a surprise visitor in town. Brexit mastermind Nigel Farage is here. Of course, he played a key role in Britain's decision to leave the EU. We're going to find out if he thinks Donald Trump has what it takes to help lead America outside of the clutches of globalist powers. All right, so talk to me a little bit about the rise in nationalism that we're seeing globally. So many people are saying it's uh, racism, xenophobia, rather than citizens wanting to rise up, reclaim their sovereignty from global powers. So what do you really see as behind Brexit and other countries? Well, what I've seen is, is, is several decades of big politics, big government, uh, treating democracy with contempt, uh, treating anybody that was even vaguely patriotic about their country and their identity um, as somehow being really absolutely awful. I mean, what a dreadful thing for people to do. Uh, I've seen uh, an international political order uh, that has led us into an endless series of foreign wars, uh, which in many cases have made things worse, not better. Um, and at the heart of all of it, uh, corporatism, the big international businesses virtually owning politics and the rich getting massively richer and the ordinary Joe being left behind. So things have gone badly wrong. And I think people have become very unhappy about this. They recognize this and they're beginning to find political opportunities to express that. And Brexit was exactly that. Brexit was, despite everybody threatening us, everyone telling us it would be a terrible mistake, the British people said, to hell with you. We want to take back power over our lives. And that's actually what it's about. That's what this reassertion of democracy is really about. Right. And we saw so much fear being put out there. So many naysayers, so many doom, doomsdayers, um, really kind of warning the rest of the world, don't you dare think about reclaiming your sovereignty. Um, what, do you, what do you see would be the effect of Brexit for the world? Well, what Brexit shows, firstly, is that any campaign can win. Any campaign can win. You can beat the big guys, you can beat the establishment if you inspire ordinary people to engage in a democratic process. That's the first thing. Um, and secondly, I, I just have a feeling that things aren't ever going to be quite the same again. Yes. I, I think it's such a fundamental, it's not just a British event, it's not just a European event, it is, a, it is an event of global significance. And, I, and, and that's good. We need change. I mean, unless people think that voting can change things, why would you ever bother to vote? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so now you're here in, in Cleveland at the Republican National Convention. Uh, Donald Trump was just named as the Republican nominee. Are you here to endorse Donald Trump? No, I'm not. And that would be a terrible mistake. You know, after all, uh, President Obama uh, engaged himself in in British politics and had the counter effect. I'm not an American. I'm not an American voter. I'm here watching, a, a, you know, a part of your democratic process with great interest. But I'm also here bringing a message from the Brexit campaign that if you can reach the hearts and minds of ordinary people, you can change anything. And what do you think a Donald Trump administration uh, would would bring not only to our relationships with our oldest ally, but to the rest of the world? Well, I think that remains to be seen. I mean, clearly Trump is fighting on an America first ticket. Um, and there's a feeling that maybe the interests of ordinary Americans need putting higher up the food chain than perhaps they've been uh, under the last couple of administrations. So we'll have to see. As far as we're concerned, I mean, look, let's be honest about it. You know, the UK and the USA, you know, we are pretty much, we have been for a long time, the closest allies in the world. You know, we've stood together through some pretty heavy stuff. Uh, and frankly, if we hadn't done that in the 20th century, uh, the world would be a much darker place than it is today. I believe that what we've done is to free ourselves from this political club and we can now come and talk to you about doing trade deals. We can talk to you, you know, about foreign policy cooperation. There are lots of things we can now have a proper conversation about. And when President Obama said that the United Kingdom would be at the back of the queue, it was an absolutely disgraceful thing to say. And I hope we're somewhere near the front of your queue or line, as you normally say. <laughs> Yes, well, we were all very excited, stayed up late to celebrate along with you all. Um, now, um, what advice can you offer us here in the U.S. in regards to open immigration, um, as well as secret trade deals? Any advice? Well, the immigration thing is different because your chief problem, as I see it, is actually illegal immigration, whereas ours, oddly, was legal immigration. Ours was the entire European Union being able to come to our country. But, but you know... 
The lessons are the same. Unless your citizens feel that you as a government are in control and have a strategy, then they will become contemptuous of you. So different reasons, but similar result. And, and this stuff does matter to people. It matters to people hugely. Okay, and one last question. You bravely led Britain out of the EU. Do you think that Donald Trump could lead that type of resistance here in the US? <sighs> That's for you to judge. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, clearly, clearly, you know, I, he, he, he has taken on the establishment in Washington and inside his own party. And I'm going to be fascinated to see tomorrow what he's got to say uh, and, 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 and kind of how he says it too. Well, can you just begin to walk away? What was that? This is the nature. Hey, what was that, Slur? This is the nature of Donald Trump. They have zero intellect, they have zero depth to their points. When you try to challenge them to a debate, they give you the middle finger and they walk away. This happens every time. I've been exposing this all week. Try to talk to these protesters. See if they have any data to back up their points. See if they can handle a debate in the streets. You will see exactly what just happened. That Hillary Clinton did anything wrong, and if you did, would she still be in this election? James Comey publicly indicted Hillary Clinton with his rhetoric, saying she was extremely careless and that she lied about her email. Empirical data. You have no empirical data no empirical against data, Hillary Clinton. Even she admitted she deleted the emails. So you're saying Hillary Clinton lied about herself deleting emails? Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Colin Powell had his own emails. Condoleezza Rice had okay, her own so emails. Break, so Okay, wait, wait. Let, me, let me finish. She was cleared of that, and because you have no data on Benghazi or the email. Um, I have no data on Benghazi yeah, but, except four dead Americans. So, no data on Benghazi except four dead Americans. John McCain is the war hero, is he? Yes, yes. McCain, McCain is the war hero. John McCain is the war hero. Debate that. He's John McCain is the war hero. No, no, what idiot listen, said that? Listen, what idiot John said that? Was a what idiot said that? John McCain is the war hero. He's not. He spent the time in the hand. Get out of here. And he was Get out of here. Get out of here. He was a legacy. His father was an admiral. God bless each and every one of you. And God bless the United States of America. And that was a video of Ted Cruz as he was booed off the stage at the RNC convention. And this is when he refused to endorse Donald Trump. Now, Cruz said one of the reasons he doesn't support Trump is because Trump, I guess, insulted his family, talked about his wife or about his father. And while I do not encourage those things, I know that those things are rather common when you get into the election cycle. He says, go with your conscience. And when you think about it, uh, many people are in the left-right paradigm, which would say, go with your conscience, go with Hillary Clinton and why he would endorse her over Trump is a far mystery to me. I guess you could also talk about other guys like Gary Johnson, the Libertarian Party. But I think he was referring to uh, Mrs. Clinton when he made that statement. And he's saying that she's going to be better for the country. And as a Republican, him being a Republican, not myself, I was very surprised and shocked to hear him say that. But uh, I really think we've learned a lot about Ted Cruz here in the past year. Previously, he had done a lot of good stuff. He talked about the Federal Reserve and other things I liked about the guy. But uh, when it came down to the brass tacks, you know, he couldn't be bothered to show up for a vote for the Federal Reserve, many other things as well. And that's just who Ted Cruz is. Now, earlier in our broadcast, Darren McBreen brought you a lot of news about attacks on police officers. And I'll touch on one here, a very deliberate attack in Australia. And they said basically somebody filled up a vehicle full of gas bottles and they drove the car inside the police station to a parking garage, but the car did not explode. They're saying it's still under investigation and they'll I get to the bottom of it, try to figure out exactly what the guy was up to. It was uh, put out there that it may have been a terror attack, you know, in the conventional thought of a con terror attack, but BBC pointed out there's no official confirmation. So we'll keep an eye on that as things develop. Now, with that in mind, we definitely know that police have a very dangerous job, a very thankless job. Um, while we do see the very unfortunate things that the police do, oftentimes we don't see the good things that they do. You know, we don't see them helping old ladies across the street or getting the cat out the tree or, you know, walking kids home in a bad neighborhood. We oftentimes see the bad. So you have to be conscious 
of the good and the bad, but you also don't neglect the bad. You understand that it's there. You try to understand why these things happen. And this is one of the things that many people do not understand why it happened at all. And this was a gentleman, Charles Kinsley. Uh, he is a service worker. He works with autistic people. Uh, he had one of his patients wander out of the group home and out into the streets. The gentleman, the autistic gentleman, had a toy truck. It's walking around a neighborhood and people called in saying this guy was toying a gun. And this is what really concerns me because people always want to talk, the, talk about the open carriers and all this stuff. And it's really not the issue because when you have people that are carrying a toy truck or we've seen schools get shut down because people had umbrellas or kids getting uh, kicked out of school because they're playing with colorful like orange and green Nerf guns in their front yard, it's not the open carriers who are doing this stuff, it's the how people respond to it. Open carry is a completely different thing. But basically back to the story of Charles here, he was lying on the ground with his hands up in the air, you know, hands up, don't shoot, laying prone on his back, had his hands in the air, talking to the cops, talking also to his patient. He's telling the patient, please get down on the ground, put your hands down, the guy's being uncooperative. And lo and behold, a police officer fires off around and shoots him in the leg. Now there are many different videos of this. Every single one I saw doesn't show the shooting itself. It shows Charles before the shooting and after shooting after they have him handcuffed. So if there's a video out there, you can put it in the description. I'll be happy to look at it. Uh, but Charles says he was shot in the leg and he talked to the officer. These are the words of Charles. He says, why did you shoot me? And the officer responds, I don't know. I, <laughs> that is just beyond comprehension how you can have a guy who's being so compliant trying to be so polite, uh, having a good sense of communication with the officers, and the officers shoot him anyway because they're just they're so on edge. Uh, and that's by no means an excuse for what the officers did. He def or the officer definitely needs to be reprimanded, and I'd say flat out needs to lose his job if you will shoot a guy unarmed on the ground with his hands up. There is no excuse for that whatsoever. Even if people did call in as a, uh, a guy with a gun, that's why you go investigate. I understand, you know, if you get a call, a guy in a gun, you may show up with your, with your heavy armor, maybe your rifle out, but you go investigate. You just don't shoot a guy, especially the guy who didn't even do it. He didn't even have the object in his hand, which, as we pointed out, was a toy truck. But that's enough on that. Now, let's talk about something that's going on overseas. And I hear these stories rather often. And, and to an extent, I always thought they were kind of old wives tale. Like, you don't go to that country. They don't have these uh, self-defense like we have here in the United States. And I'm not just talking about uh, the right to bear arms. I'm talking about self-defense in general, where they would arrest you. And I hear people, I even heard Alex, I'm like, oh, come on, Alex, it can't be that bad. Well, it is that bad. Uh, here we have a story here. Four years in jail damages. Finnish man sentenced for defending home against invasion. And this is back in April, a 35-year-old man heard a knock on his door. He went to open it and in rushed three intruders holding baseball bats and a gun. The man, the homeowner, then retreated to his kitchen where he found a knife and was able to fight off the, intrud the intruders, two men and one woman. So I want you to picture this. Three people rush into your house. One of them has a gun. At least one of them has a baseball bat. They're in there, you know, fighting you. You go, you grab a knife. You fight off three people armed with a gun and a baseball bat. Now, I would say that's a if that happened here in the United States of America, I'd say, hey, that's great. The guy, you know, he went in there. He, he whooped him up. Uh, he's defending his home, his castle. He wasn't. Uh, in violation of anything, thus is my opinion, because you hear stories here in the United States, well, maybe you chase the guy down the street, you shoot him in the back, you can't do that. But this guy wasn't doing that, he was in his home, he was in his castle, he picked up a weapon to defend himself, and now he is getting a tougher sentence than the people who actually invaded his home. And the homeowner has been convicted of excessive self-defense and attempted manslaughter. He will serve an unconditional sentence of four years and two months which will he which he will spend in prison. He's also been paid, will pay damages to his attackers. So these people broke into his home. They attacked him in his home. They used a gun on him in his home, brandished a gun on him in, in his home, uh, brandished a baseball bat on him in his home. And because he picked up a knife, he has to pay them twenty three thousand dollars. Does that make sense to anybody who's listening to this? And these are the type of laws people have to deal with overseas. But to tell you what happened to the home invaders, all three received a one one year and two months conditional sentence, which is similar to probation in uh, in Finland. And they've also been ordered to pay the homeowner 
$3,300. So they have to pay him $3,300, but he has to pay them $23,000. He has to pay them $20,000 for breaking into his house with weapons, with a gun and a, uh, and a baseball bat, but the homeowner has to pay them. And this is the kind of backwards logic that we see going on in the world today, where if you defend yourself, they say something's wrong with you. I was actually watching one of those, uh, those judge shows, you know, it's like there's a million of them, but uh, basically this guy, he was out somewhere and some guys uh, were trying to get rough with his wife, with his girlfriend or whatever. So he takes him on. And then the judge is talking down to the guy who was defending his wife. He's like, well, you're not a tough guy. You should just let him do it. He's like, so I'm just supposed to stand there as these people attack my wife? No, the guy was like, he wasn't, you know, UFC fight. He wasn't Tim Kennedy or anything like that. The guy said he did a little bit of wrestling in high school or college or whatever, and he knew a little little bit to defend himself, and he actually did defend himself. And the judge wants to, you know, point the finger at him, like, you should just let him steal your purse and smack your wife. And I'm like, what is this mentality here? And not just in the United States, but in the world, this curl up in a ball, safe space, do whatever you want to me, just not in the face kind of mentality. So that's my rant on that, and that is the news blitz for the day. I'm Jakari Jackson reporting from the InfoWars Command Center. The 2016 RNC has gone completely as expected. Communist anti-Trump protesters attacking Alex Jones. We are here to tell George Soros and Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and the rest of the globalists, you're not going to start a civil war in this country. Nazi scum! Nazi scum! Nazi scum! Nazi scum! Nazi scum! The burning of the American flag that resulted in charring the anti-American scum that lit old glory up in the first place. You're on fire! You're on fire, stupid! Anti-Trump protesters throwing human waste on the police, a mysterious bomb threat after a garbage truck was stolen, and lying Ted Cruz's career killing primetime non-endorsement of Donald Trump's GOP presidential nomination. The case we have to make to the American people, the case each person in this room has to make to the American people, is to commit to each of them that we will defend freedom and be faithful to the Constitution. We will unite the party, we will unite the country by standing together for shared values, by standing for liberty. God bless each and every one of you, and God bless the United States of America. But then the crowd was getting kind of restless, and they started chanting, endorse Trump, endorse Trump, endorse Trump. And he just kept forging ahead with his pre-planned speech, and he did not stick to what he said that he was going to do when he made that pledge to the RNC that he would endorse the candidate no matter who it was. And now he officially is Lion Ted, I guess. Joe Biggs, what do you think? Yeah, so back when this whole thing, this whole race for the White House took off, every candidate had to come out and sign a pledge saying, you know what, if I lose, I will endorse the Republican nomination, stand behind that guy to help unify the party. You know, Ted Cruz walks out, like you said earlier, he hit all the points that Trump's been making. Stronger security, stronger, uh, you know, border security, military, you know, more jobs for the American people, all the things that we want. But then he says, we need to unify the party. And he basically just almost like drops the mic and walks off without even coming out and officially going, you know what, I'm Ted Cruz, I'm behind Trump, you should be behind Trump. Let's unify, let's come together, let's beat Hillary Clinton. Now here's a look at some of the more accepted speeches at the RNC. They're afraid of free speech, and that's what they always try to do, is come and disrupt people and take over their free speech. These are not liberals. These are anti-free speech, anti-freedom scum who need to get their ass to the country. Now, one of the things that I have learned about Hillary Clinton is that one of her heroes, her mentors, was Saul Alinsky. And her senior thesis was about Saul Alinsky. This was someone that she greatly admired and that affected all of her philosophies subsequently. Now, interestingly enough, let me tell you something about Saul Alinsky. He wrote a book called Rules for Radicals. On the dedication page, it acknowledges Lucifer 
the original radical who gained his own kingdom. Now think about that. This is a nation where our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, talks about certain inalienable rights that come from our creator. This is a nation where our Pledge of Allegiance says we are one nation under God. This is a nation. This is a nation where every coin in our pocket and every bill in our wallet says, in God we trust. I think it's important to say that we got to make sure that the, uh, the hell the veterans return from is not the hell to come home to, okay? Hillary Clinton putting big government spending financed by the Chinese ahead of good paying jobs for middle class Americans. Is she guilty or not guilty? Of course, Melania Trump's faux plagiarism got more airtime scrutiny by the mainstream media than the federal government's corruption displayed by the DOJ and the FBI over Hillary Clinton's clear criminal abuse of the United States national security. Donald Trump will be making the speech of his life tonight after experiencing the invigorating palatable anger displayed at the RNC. Black people are killed in a church? Whose fault is that? A white man! Do you know who's taking money from Big Pharma? Hillary! Everybody! Hillary. Wrong! Donald Trump has taken Hillary. zero money from Big Pharma! Hillary. I stuck you on that one! The rage against the global Clinton Foundation self-serving machine, the constitution-killing Obama administration, and the awareness of the underlying emerging New World Order system. Well, what I've seen is, is, is several decades of big politics, big government, uh, treating democracy with contempt, uh, treating anybody that was even vaguely patriotic about their country and their identity uh, as somehow being really absolutely awful. I mean, what a dreadful thing for people to do. Uh, I've seen uh, an international political order uh, that has led us into an endless series of foreign wars, uh, which in many cases have made things worse, not better. A glimpse of the resurrection of the wounded yet inexorable Republic of the United States of America. So is this an insurrection? Yes, it's not an insurrection, it's, it's, it's a correction. John Bound for Infowars.com. I'm Ashley Beckford reporting for Infowars.com. I'm out on the streets of Austin, Texas today to find out if people actually want to give up American sovereignty and go into a communist totalitarian world government. Let's see what Austinites have to say. We're never going to become a communist country. There's no chance. We aren't? We're always going to be a capitalist country. We're built on capitalism. People think that America should become a communist country, a communist, you know, run state, or should we stick uh, with the capitalism and the constitution? And... Uh, I don't want to comment, actually. You don't? Yeah, I don't, I don't really. I just was curious. Do you think America should become a communist state? No. Why not? I think it's okay if it was a... Um... If a majority of the people wanted to have the communist system, if it was a democracy, then yeah, it's, uh, it should be people choose. Well, I'm out here asking people today if they think that America should be a communist country or a capitalist country. Uh, capitalist. I mean, uh, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not for the, commu the, the communist thing. I, Why not? I, just, I think that we, uh, we should be able to have freedom of choice to work and do what we want, when we want. I'm not from here, I'm from Australia. Oh, okay, so, so are you a fan of communism or capitalism? What do you think uh, America should be? Um, keep it the way it is. Why would you want to be a communist country? At the basis of what communism is, is going through the same problems I think of what we're going through now, where you have a select few that control uh, a lot of what we have in our lives, whether mm -hmm. that's food resources, energy allocation, you have a select few that controls that for the rest of the population, yeah. which I'm very much against. And I think that in regards to communism, if you look at history, which has proven to be substantial facts, it has not worked in most societies. Right. So I think that because of that, any any sort of one, like one, um, one way uh, source of thinking of like, oh, only communism works, I think that's flawed. And I think that we have the evidence to, to determine that it doesn't work. 
And I think that we have to focus on what has happened in the past in order to kind of be able to re reroute what's going to happen. So there you have it. I'm really surprised that when I came out here, half the people don't care or know what political system America is under. So that's really ridiculous. Coming from the fact that there are people out here with the revolutionary communists who are actually burning American flags and saying that they want to create a revolutionary communist society right here in America. So what we need to do is stand up and make sure that people know about these revolutionary communists and know what socialism brings. It's never worked. It's never going to work. And Venezuela is a perfect modern example of how socialism is not working. Do you want to pay, you know, $150 for a loaf of bread? If if you do, then move to Venezuela because we don't want you here. I'm Ashley Beckford for InfoWars.com. Please stay tuned for more special reports. All right, folks, that's going to do it for tonight's broadcast. InfoWars Nightly News will return, Lord willing, tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Until then, have a blessed evening. We'll see you back right here tomorrow. Good night.